Welcome to the Commercial Gas Engineer channel. Just continuing my first sites. So I'm going to show you my first site as a commercial gas engineer. This is part two. In this video, it's basically set in about 2018 when these took place, um, about September. And these are one of the jobs I came across where valent flu system was basically deteriorating and the flues needed to be replaced. I'm sure you've come across flues like this. And here is another one. And then this was another site altogether. I cannot remember what I was doing on this particular site. But the boilers that were there were Potterton commercials, older versions. I do recall this particular site now. So there was a gas-fired water heater. And I think this was my first experience in 2018 with a gas-fired water heater. And I was thinking to myself, what on earth is this? Remember, no one's told me about gas-fired water heaters at, up until this time. So I was looking at this thing thinking I've seen hot water cylinders i've seen hot water cylinders but what on earth is this i didn't realize at the time that they were gas fired water heaters so i was just amazed I was taking pictures the particular unit was a locking bar turbocharger an 85 kilowatt input unit so i was taking pictures of it to get my head around what was going on on the unit i was also quite surprised at how many people a gas-fired water heater, even just a single one, could serve. This is pictures from inside a, a valent commercial boiler. On this particular site, scaffolding was put up and we had to change the vertical flues. Remember the damaged flues I showed you earlier? Well, on the valents, well, we were repairing them. And here they are. In this particular job, we have some leaks on a roof. Some, quite a few pinhole leaks. I recall this particular site. I think I went here, it may be in a school, and I was inspecting or having to replace the um, damper motors. Then this was probably one of my first experiences with an Ideal Concord Super Series. What a classic boiler, what a classic module. Now in this picture here, the two of us removing sections of a boiler and trying to seal them. Here we are, here we have it. And here's the boiler. I reckon it was a Ramea. Oh, oh, this site was lovely. There was a leak in a high rise building in central London and I had to replace it. It was on some low carbon steel. This was my first experience with a press gun and quite an experience. And also, I, don't, I, don't, I think at the time it was also probably my first experience with a recip saw. So I hired a recip saw and a press gun and had quite an adventure on some seven bar, seven to eight bar pressure. Sorry, I apologize, 6.9 bar. So here I am in the plant room. I don't know why they gave me a recip saw that I had to plug into a transformer and so on. That was a bit annoying. At the time I should have complained and said, no, I need a cordless this one or it's not happening. So here we have it, cut through the pipe that I needed. But really, with the lack of experience that I had, I shouldn't have been doing this on my own. In this, the size of the building and the the lack of experience that I had with recip saws and pipe work in a commercial setting, there's no way I should have been doing this job on my own. But I took it on. I didn't. I didn't refuse it. Now, as you can clearly see, when I was using the press gun, I had it in the complete wrong place. I'm here. I should have been here. So when I crimped it, it wasn't quite crimped properly. And I had a limited amount of fittings. And here's the press gun I was using. I should have asked them to show me in the shop how to use the gun. Because in the shop sometimes they do actually say, do you know how to use this? And I must have said, yeah, 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 of course. If they ever ask you and you don't know how to use one, go on YouTube or, or just say, can you show me how to use it? Because it's a lot better than seven bar of pressure flying out towards you, which is what happened to me. So here's the setup. This is where I was working in the basement of a high rise and here was the leak that I was cutting and then I just flooded the place more and more and went through fittings because I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Thankfully I got to grips with the press gun and got a decent connection. Okay here's me working on a HIU unit. At times they were asking us to go in the flat and work on the HIU units when they weren't working. So what would I do? I would tend to see if the pump was running I would also make sure, obviously, that the heat was coming in. I would check actuators to make sure that they are opening. Sometimes you have to even remove them, see if the pin's stuck and things like that. 
I'd be looking for are there any circulation issues and so on. so as you can see here I think they were only getting 33 celsius but for some reason I I think I decided to just quickly reduce the flow rate to give the unit time to heat the water up and then I did get an increase in temperature by reducing the flow rate because it was gushing through and then they started to get an increase in temperature of 40 celsius but there are obviously filters and different things that you can do to just look for where the restriction is because if the heat is coming from the plant room then the problem lies with the HIU unit. I think on this particular site, I started to get so desperate. And also because I was not um, sure, I didn't want to play with the HIU unit too much. I decided to just reduce the flow rate on absolutely everything, an experiment. And then lo and behold, I got 60 Celsius on the unit and I was happy. So um, I was, um, when, when, you, when, you're, when you don't have much experience, on HIU units or commercial plant rooms, you would start you start to experiment a bit and take pictures and have a fiddle. And I got I got lucky on this particular one. But it's best to ask for advice. And at the moment, there are loads of videos online on HIU units. There are manuals out there so that you can get them up and running without doing what I did at this time, which was just experiment. But I was quite chuffed with my quick fix at the time, and the client was happy that they had hot water. Okay, on this particular site, I'll tell you what happened. And accidents happen to experienced engineers as well. But when you're inexperienced, I think there's even more chance of accidents happening. On this particular site, this picture was taken probably a few minutes or seconds before I had a major accident. So two of us were replacing this heat exchanger when somehow the heat exchanger fell on my head. We thought that there were a few bits still holding the unit in place. And for some reason, even though we were doing something that was quite dangerous, we were there having a chat, a little chinwag, catching up about different things, talking, 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 talking. And then just as we were undoing the, one of the last bolts or one of the last bolts or nuts or, or, or connections, all of a sudden the heat exchanger falls on me. This is the picture I took from lying down on the floor. And that was the damage it did to my head. It just pierced a, a, a wee hole in my head. But word of advice, just be careful when you're doing things that are dangerous. And also don't talk whilst you're doing he moving heavy machinery or doing something dangerous. Just focus on that, that one thing. And this was the situation outside with the unit, with the, with the um, heat exchanger out. Thankfully, at the time, I had a good colleague with me that was um, quite supportive after the accident and didn't spend too much time laughing at me but um, was quite helpful and and um, was going to take me to the hospital but I went there myself but I can look back now and laugh four years later thinking uh, I got I got off um, scot-free from that one and that you have to be a bit more careful when um, doing certain jobs okay in this particular job was changing a burner module so one of the modules on this ideal was being changed it was in a roof space so it was a bit awkward so here's the unit and this is from down here we had to get it upstairs so we used some rope one was upstairs the other one was downstairs lifting it up the ladder whilst the other person was sort of like um pulling it up but without trying to take the weight of the person basically lifting it up the ladder but it was very awkward getting it up very awkward you don't want to damage the module and there's a bit of rope we used to help us get it up as well. Okay, this was an ADI CD650. I haven't, I don't think I've even come across this boiler again. Possibly I may have. I just remember this boiler on the right making a racket for a long time. A very screeching noise, screeching noise. And I don't recall ever getting to the bottom of it, nor anybody else. I think I was kind of set up, set up on this particular job. I recall being sent there to sort of change the air inlet filter or something like that. And even though I changed the air inlet filter over here, I don't even recall it being the right, the right exact size, like for like. It may have been slightly bigger or slightly smaller. I remember there being a discrepancy, but that's what the other engineer ordered. And I went to change it and I had a look. And I think that's what their solution was, changing the air inlet to reduce the noise change it there's still noise i can't recall maybe i made adjustments to combustion but i just remember there being a screeching noise and sometimes you could get rid of it for a moment and then it would come back 
I also recalled being on this site and it was the first time I came across a submergible pump, a sump pump. Um, I, I was sent to replace it. And I remember thinking, what on earth are they talking about? A submergible pump. Obviously, you don't know about these things when you first start out. Nobody tells you and pulls you to one side and says, this is what you need to know. This and this and that. You learn it gradually. This particular site, I think I was sent here because they wanted to know, was there enough ventilation for the boilers that were in situ? I was asked to work out how much ventilation there was. I did it on what the maximum output these burners could operate at and not at what they were actually set to. I worked out what was the maximum. If somebody ranged these boilers up, what would be the maximum that they could output? And then that's how I worked out the ventilation, not based upon what they're actually set to. So that's what I decided to go by. What is wrong with this installation? I'll tell you what's wrong. You have open food boilers terminating far too low. I believe what happened was they got, they got, they, they were basically, they weren't, um, there was no flue dilution on them. They could have installed a flue dilution system, but they didn't do that. Instead, they decided to route the flues right up to the top of the building. I think in this particular site, I think this was a care home and I did not get to the bottom of it. I believe I did not get to the bottom of it. Um, I think I was sent here to change some air pressure switches, but I believe on this particular job, I recall the boilers overheating. And at the time, I did not have enough experience to get to the bottom as to where the circulation issue was and how to check the pumps and so on. If the pumps were operating properly and check temperatures, I didn't know how to do that at this particular time. So here you have it. B112. I believe that fault code was due to overheating. So this is that site with the flues terminating too low. And here the flue is, the new flue at the top. And in the, the same site where those flues were being done, I had to replace some of the pipe work. And this was my second job of doing pipe work, even though I shouldn't have been on my own doing this, by the way. But it was my second job of doing pipe work. And um, this time it went a bit better. I recall working for this particular company, I didn't have to go into the BMS panel too much. If there was a BMS problem, we had a BMS engineer and we'd get them to go in there. So if there was no power going to the boilers, if there was any sort of problem like that controls problem, we would get the BMS engineer out. We just had to make sure that the boilers were ready to fire. Okay, I'll continue my videos on the first uh, couple of months as a commercial engineer in 2018. Thank you for joining me. Um, please leave comments in the section below. Until next time, bye-bye-bye.